telephone, the state director of Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia branch, Mr. Jason Huffman. Jason, good morning to you, sir. Hey, good morning. How y'all doing? We're doing well. Great to have you with us. So long for the ride here, man. What are you up to these days? Anything fun? Well, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a busy time. And folks like me who watch politics closely, um, kind of contemplating the state of things after this election cycle. It's pretty interesting. And how? Now, you don't do party or candidate advocacy. You do policy advocacy, but your policy tends to be more conservative in regards to fiscal policy. And that tends to reflect more on Republicans uh, in general, the way people feel about things, than it does Democrats. As you look at this last election that took place and the Republicans in charge of the House, the Senate, and of course, now the White House, uh, what do you see policy-wise in store for the American people and for West Virginia? Because it's the same story in West Virginia with one-party control. Well, I think, you know, First and foremost, when we're talking about the election, just to, to brag on our, our staff and our activists across the state at Americans for Prosperity here in West Virginia, we knocked on over uh, 240,000 doors all across the state and, and had over 30,000 discussions with West Virginians at their doorstep. Um, and we think we have a pretty good feel for, for where folks are at and that there's some pretty clear impacts um, that this election is going to have on how policy decisions are made in West Virginia. Um, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear now that West Virginia is a deeply, deeply red state. I, I don't see that landscape changing anytime soon. Um, and really, you know, one of the things I always point to is that sometimes when politicians go to Charleston, they forget why they're elected in the first place. Um, and here's a hint, especially in this landscape. It is not to pass mediocre watered down policies. I, I, I think this election really represents a mandate from the people to to be bold. Uh, and that's what we saw at the ballot box and, and at the doors talking to folks all across the state. They want policymakers to, to be transformational when they pass reforms um, and do things that we know are, are going to make the state a better place to live, work, and raise a family. What's an example of some transformational reform that uh, AFP West Virginia or AFP National is working towards? Well, right now, I think um, when it comes to, to 2025, you know, there are a ton of policies that are vying for the top spot. Um, and, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I think that there's a minority of lawmakers who, who fit that previous bucket I was just talking about that kind of forget why they, they got elected. I, I think for the most part, lawmakers in this state understand the assignments, so to speak, from voters. And, and we're really fortunate from a, a policy perspective moving forward. Um, that the majority of our elected officials are, are very principled folks who are staunchly reform minded. And so I, I expect to see a lot of big time policy wins happen in 2025 and beyond. Uh, the, the lawmakers I'm talking to are pretty eager to roll their sleeves up and, and sort of resume the work of uh, really rapidly enacting the, the sort of pro growth reforms that, that we know we need to do to, to transform the state. And you know, Rob, not to mention, you know, you have Governor-elect Patrick Morrissey at the helm who, I mean, listen, this guy, he, he campaigned on and was elected by this mandate to do big things from people. And so Patrick Morrissey's a guy who's – he keeps his promises. Um, and first and foremost, he's he's a student of what good policy looks like. So he's, he's not afraid to take on those big fights, and I think he's got a legislature that's that's similarly situated. Have you compiled your list of legislative goals for 2025 in this new legislature that takes a seat in January? Uh, we have. We've been thinking about it quite a bit. Um, although, you know, with the session occurring in February, you know, they give them an extra month before the regular session begins so that um, the governor-elect is able to stand up as administration and, and get the ducks in a row. Uh, we've got a little bit more time to think, so perhaps we're not as, uh, as ready as we would be in a, a normal year. But – Listen, I, I think cutting needless government red tape got to be near the top of the list. You know, like I said, there's a lot of competing priorities, but the fact of the matter is that West Virginia is just we're too out of step with our neighboring states um, who we're competing with for population and business. Uh, we've got a lot of unnecessary government red tape that's in the way, you know, whether it's these regulatory regimes you see that um, instead of protecting public health and safety, 
uh, they're just there to stymie competition and keep the average West Virginian out of a out of a certain occupation. Or you know you see regulations that that they're either archaic um, or they haven't been evaluated from an effective standpoint. So I, I think we'll see a major push to get unnecessary government red tape out of the way. It's an obstacle to growth and opportunity for our citizens. John, I'm going to go to you first here. Hang on, Bill. John? Now, when you were just talking about cutting unnecessary red tape, did I just hear you use words that actually mean certificate of need, cutting, getting rid of certificates of need, when you're talking about anti-competitive uh, regulations? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's right. I mean, I was going to get there next, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> Go there first. Uh, I, I do consider it. I do consider it to be red tape. I mean, that's a perfect example, right? You you have for folks that don't know certificate of need, uh, and we've talked about it a ton on this show, but um, it's a permission slip from government that either aspiring or current medical providers have to get if they want to create new or expand their services. Um, and listen, I, I I'll just I'll just quote the research. This is a perfect example of the kind of red tape that's holding us back. Um, the Knee Research Center, Regulatory Research Center at West Virginia University, they recently did an extensive review of the academic research that, that is focused on how certificate of need laws impact healthcare. 88% of scholarly research conducted tells us that CUN either has no effect or has a detrimental effect on healthcare. Um, so the, the the body of evidence, I mean, without a doubt, I think at this point, as it continues to grow, it, it tells us full elimination of certificate of need laws is is the way to go if you want to improve quality of health care, increase access, lower costs. Um, but that's, I mean, that's just one of the myriad um, sort of red tape reduction efforts that we've got to be engaged in. But does it, isn't the argument that in the rural, sparsely populated areas of the state, there, there would be no health care but for certificates of need? Um, I think that the data does not bear that out. In fact, what, what we see instead is um, kind of the opposite, really. I mean, you, anytime that you look at rural health care providers and, and underserved populations, and again, I'm, I'm going off of the, the assessment of the, the research from, from the Knee Center at WVU, uh, 82%. Uh, when they talk about underserved populations, 82% of the studies indicated that certificate of need diminished care for those populations, particularly rural areas. Um, 0% of those studies said that CON enhanced care for underserved populations. And what, what you hear from opponents of repealing certificate of need is that there's going to be this, you know, cherry picking that occurs where, you know, people come in from out of state and they, they pick up all the good services and you're not able to actually make your bottom line work. There, there's just zero evidence to suggest that's going to actually happen. Um, remember, you know, at some point, every state had to get need laws. It was, a, it was a mandate from the federal government. Uh, and today, about, you know, 40 percent of the nation's population lives in the state with very few or no certificate of need laws. Uh, you, you don't see that happening in these states, um, and, and states without certificate of need laws generally have uh, more facilities per capita. So I, I think that that has been debunked. Yeah, uh, I have a question, but let's stay on certificate of need for just a second. You mentioned there's no evidence of cherry picking. That may not that may be the case in the medical side, but the hospice side there is numerous examples of cherry picking where. The hospice, uh, the uh, nonprofit hospice, actually been forced out of business. And in full disclosure, Bill is on I'm, the board of hospice of the Panhandle. I am Jason. that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of examples in the hospice uh, arena. So, uh, Go ahead, Jason. Well, you, you want to give me one, Bill? Uh, yeah. Uh, in uh, in Maryland, there's some. The uh, the number of nonprofits in Maryland uh, has decreased substantially with a, a very aggressive hospice uh, uh, approach, uh, for profit approach. Maryland, we have that in Pennsylvania as well. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's certainly something I'll I'll take a look at when we uh, when we hang up here. But yeah. according to the data that I'm looking at, uh, and again, this is this is over 430 some scholarly. Mm -hmm pieces of academic research 
um, they, they have not found that cherry picking argument to be something that is evidenced that, that, that bears out the evidence. Although I'd love to talk to you afterwards and just see, uh, sure. I'll, uh, I'll give can. bill your number, okay. uh, Jason. Yeah. Let me, let me go to another subject if I can, Jason. Uh, in 2016, you wrote, you mentioned scholarly. I think you wrote a scholarly piece for Forbes magazine, contrast in uh, North Carolina and West Virginia, which are nearly neighbors, uh, as you point out. One is very progressive in their economy, a robust economy. At that time, you call West Virginia's economy stagnant. Uh, and it said as, as a direct consequence of free market reforms. I suspect today you'd write that article somewhat differently, but would the, the same tenets apply today as you did in 2016? Well, Bill, first I'll say that's that's one of the few times I've been accused of being scholarly, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I thought it was a nice piece. That, I thought it was a nice piece. I enjoyed it. So. Well, I'm, I'm yeah. glad. Um, and I think it's, it's apt because, you know, we are so close to North Carolina, actually, uh, not very many folks know this, but when they were developing Charlotte, um, the the folks who planned some cities here in, in West Virginia, including Charleston, went down to help those folks figure out how they ought to lay their city out. So we were we were neck and neck on competition at one point in time, uh, and throughout the years we've just seen a an instance where you know I think the name of that article, if I if I remember from that far back, was a, a tale of two states or something to that effect. Um, and basically, yeah, we, we made a lot of uh, protectionist sort of anti-growth policy decisions, and it led to uh, population decline. You know, you, you talk about the brain drain that we have witnessed where West Virginia was in a, a, a demographic winter for a very long time. In fact, I think it was 2022 when we, we finally uh, – came out of a stance where uh, more people were, were passing away or leaving and moving to the state. Um, and, you know, they made some decisions down in North Carolina that were fairly prudent and ahead of the time for, for us. Uh, and since we followed suit, so you're right, I, I, would, I would say and I would indicate maybe it's a good idea to go back and revisit that piece and do a little update because since that time, um, we have conducted our own set of reforms here, be that uh, you know aggressive tax reform to put money back into the pockets of hardworking West Virginia families, um, the ability for folks to enroll their child in any public school they want to and, and to seek uh, educational options outside of the traditional system through through educational freedom. Um, you know, and again, not to not to beat a dead horse on this thing, but uh, Governor Elect Morrissey always talks about the backyard brawl that we're we're engaged in, and increasingly so with other states where we're competing for population and for business. So I, I think the equation is pretty simple: um, opportunity plus freedom equals prosperity, and that's where we have to go from a policy standpoint. And I think again, we're, we're going to see much much more of that after the results of this election. There are clearly differences between Governor Justice and Governor-elect Morrissey, but do you see them on policy being fairly the same, Jason, or do you see a difference somewhere? Uh, I think that when it comes to um, Senator-elect Justice, you know, remember that he was elected as a Democrat to office when he was first elected as governor. And I think that um, he has had a, a, for lack of a better term, come to Jesus with some of the principles um, that many lawmakers in the state espouse. And so um, later in his his career as governor, his tenure, uh, I think that he went a lot more into the, the free market pro-growth side of things um, just due to you know his evolving political philosophy. And I, I think that's right. We, we should want to see politicians uh, evolve. For the better, when it comes to the the policy priorities that they have, and you know, listen, Jim Justice is the guy that uh, brought West Virginia the largest tax cut in state history, alongside a, a, a legislature that was prioritizing that for a long time. So, um, I would expect to see moving forward, however, um, a doubling down on the things that we know are proven, the policies that we know. Uh, will make the state a better place to live, work, and raise a family. Like like I said, uh, Governor-elect Morrissey is a, is a policy guy, first and foremost. He knows what good looks like, um, and he's made a, a lot of 
um, comments and statements on the campaign that I think are indicative of what his legislative agenda could be. Um, you know, anytime that you're standing up a, a, an administration as governor, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that you have to focus on. And, and thankfully, um, you know, we have an individual, Patrick Morrissey, who uh, he has a strong bias toward liberty. And I think that he knows what good life look, looks like when it comes to policy. And so uh, we're, we're going to see uh, a lot of leadership out of the executive branch. You. This is kind of a throwaway question, Jason, but there's uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, meat to it as well. Uh, If you could talk to uh, Governor-elect Marcy, what would be his number one priority that he should seek, the number one thing he should do from day one? Well, if I could, you know, king for a day and could talk to uh, the governor-elect, I think that his standpoint of – Everything that this administration does, either from a policy or or an application of a practical application of governing standpoint, Um, I think that his desire to make sure that we're having a holistic discussion about policy, in that we know we're competing with other states, that this idea of the backyard brawl and how his his mind is focused on making us more competitive. That's got to be at the top of the list in, in all things that this administration does. So this, this is a little bit of a, a macro answer. Uh, and, and we've talked to the governor-elect, and I think that, you know, obviously he, he's well-intentioned when it comes to uh, this thought process and, and very dedicated to it. We, we can't just be as good as other states when it comes to the amount of, of freedom and opportunity we have when it comes to the, the laws we have on the books. We have to surpass them. So economic com- and bounds. economic competitiveness is uh, is certainly a goal. What about some of the infrastructure needs that we continually hear about? Our education system, salaries for teachers, salary for uh, government employees, our uh, uh, child care, and and the uh, so, uh, the corrections. There's the litany goes on and on and on. Um, I'm kind of changing the rules of the uh, the game on you, but how do you feel they fit in? Well, Bill, I know, I know you're good for that sometimes. That's why I like talking to you, brother. Um, Changing the rules no, of the game. Look, I, I think it's, it's really clear that you know we've got some significant issues that policymakers are going to have to grapple with. Um, and again, you know, anytime you have a, a new boss come in, so to speak, they're going to take a look at the way things are done, uh, and they're going to make preferences decisions based on their preferences of, of how they want things done. Uh, the, the caution I would express is twofold. One, we're not going to be able to have, and we've talked about this before, the, the sort of robust social safety net that I think some folks want uh, without growth. We have to have that growth because we have to have the revenue to do that. Um, but the, the secondary caution I would express is, is this idea that you know, just throw more money at a problem is a viable solution because I don't think it. I don't think it is. I don't think historically it has been. Um, again, we've we've got to look at the practical application of these services, determine what is being done, is it being done effectively when it comes to the outcomes that we're we're seeking over the long term. Um, and I, I just to give you an analogy, you know, you <laughs> you wouldn't put a new transmission in a vehicle that's totaled that can't get you from point A to point B. You've clearly got some other problems there that you need to think about. And I I think this idea that we're going to just throw money at a problem uh, instead of making some real changes that are are perhaps difficult ones to make, uh, pretending that more funding is the only solution out there, I think is is a mistake. John, did you have something? You made made a look. Yeah, I mean, just real quick, I don't know how much time we have. Um, Two minutes. Two minutes. No, actually a minute and a half. Uh, on on your website, the AFP uh, website, there's something here that is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, under the justice, states must continue to enact laws that help individuals successfully re-enter society after going through the criminal justice system. Do you have proposed legislation along those lines? 60 seconds, Jason. Sure. I think, listen, uh, the roadmap for that kind of reform, we've seen it before. In 2007, Governor Perry in Texas was... Tw- given a choice to either build more prisons or enact criminal justice reform. He chose the latter, and since then they've closed 11 adult prisons. Uh, we know what the roadmap is. We, we have to treat people uh, you know, that 
folks who we're mad at are different than folks that are a genuine danger to society, and we have to make that distinction in our laws. We have to put treatment beds in, in our jails and our prisons to tackle this opioid crisis and get folks back in the workforce. Jason, how can people learn more about Americans for Prosperity? I would take a look at wv.americansforprosperity.org. Good to talk with you again. Thank you, sir. Always fun, Jason. Yep. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you all. Jason Huffman at uh, 957.